Hey guys, welcome back with Keeper Jewels and our beautiful ring-tailed lemurs. Now this fella on my shoulder, his name is Kasiji. Um, he is a pretty dominant uh, fellow and he is actually living here at Symbio with his younger brother. So his younger brother is going to come up to meet you as well. Now his name is Kasiji. Now Kasiji and Kanto have been living here at Symbio for over around four years. Now they're currently six and seven years old and they were born in captivity all the way across the other side of the country at Perth Zoo. Now lemurs are a pretty big favorite in zoos across the world thanks to I like to move it, move it. <laughs> I bet you guys know what I'm talking about there. And there's of course the big famous movie called Madagascar that really did propel ringtail lemurs into fame. So they are a pretty unique species of lemur. There are over 100 different species of lemur, but they're only endemic to one part of the world. And that is of course Madagascar. Now Madagascar is an island off the coast of Africa. And the animals there have been isolated from the rest of the world for thousands and thousands of years. Now the lemurs are classified as a species uh, that is quite a primitive form of primate. Um, and they are really, really different to uh, other animals that you would think of when we talk about primates, like your, your apes and your monkeys, and then you've got your lemurs as well. Now the ringtown lemur is a pretty different lemur, as I mentioned. So they're pretty famous for their ringed tail. Um, but it does have a purpose. It's not there just to look pretty and to be a scarf when they're cold. Um, it is there to help communicate between the troop. So lemurs will actually live uh, in groups or families or troops of anywhere from around 15 all the way up to about 30 individuals within a troop. And this troop is actually governed by females. So very different to other social species that you find around the world. And there will be a dominant female who will be the boss of the entire family. The dominant female will be the boss of the entire family. So females rule when it comes to lemurs and males just like Kanto and Kasiji here um, will actually be uh, right at the bottom of the pecking order unless they are actually uh, mating with the dominant female. So typically males if they're born into the family will actually start leaving that family when they reach around three or four years old. However any females who were born in the family will actually stay as a, a part of the, the group and they will actually stay there for probably for the rest of their lives until they actually feel like they would like to breed themselves. Now the dominant female is usually the one who has the breeding rights. There will be a couple of other slightly subordinate females who will actually be able to have babies as well. They will produce usually a single baby. Um, it is also quite common for lemurs to be producing twins as well. There you go. All right. Now with Kasiji, you can see him was holding his tail up nice and high. So this is a form of communication. So not only is verbal vocalization a really important communication for lemurs, uh, but physical behaviors uh, are also very, very important. And that tail is actually helping them being able to see each other when they are traveling along the ground because ringtail lemurs are the only species of lemur who are most comfortable when they are on the ground as much as they are comfortable up in the trees. So you could say that lemurs are, or ringtail lemurs are actually the most terrestrial species of, of lemur. So by having that up, it's like a flag for them all to be able to keep an eye on each other. They can also vocalize to one another to let each other know that they are still quite close and nearby, but that's a, a really, really good, good reason to have a nice ringed tail. Now that doesn't stop there. The tails uh, also come into play uh, when males are actually fighting or being territorial, uh, especially during breeding season. So males will actually use some of their specialized scent glands. So if we can get Kasiji back up, if you can have a look at his wrists at all, see if you can zoom in there on his wrists, the inside of his wrist. Where are you? <laughs> How about we do this? There we go. No? Do you getting any of his wrists? Excellent. So if you have a look on the inside of the wrist, the males will have a scent gland on their forearm and it actually is coupled with a spur as well. So what the males do is they will actually spur into branches and other parts of furniture that they're living amongst and they will then actually integrate the scent into those marks that they put into the plants and, and furniture around their territory. Now with the tail, what they'll actually do 
is something that we call, hey, stop that. Now with the ring tail, it is also important for the males with their dominant behavior to one another during breeding season. So what they'll do is they'll sit on their tail and their tail will come right up past their chest and they were gonna use the, these scent glands on their wrists or their forearms and they're going to rub that scent all over their tail and then what they're gonna do is go up to their opponent and they're gonna waft their tail right in their face and they're gonna make a little high pitched noise and they're gonna go, 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 and really waft that tail right in the face of the other male and that's really, really offensive. That's very quite much quite a dominant behavior um, and that's called stink fighting. Stink fighting is the precursor before full-blown physical aggression. So I don't know if you can see while these guys are eating, they do have some pretty prominent canines. And the main use for these canines that you can see uh, protruding from the top of their jaws there is for uh, combat, okay? So they can actually inflict some pretty serious wounds on one another, um, especially during breeding season, all right? So they are really there for defense and attack. So it's pretty serious stuff when it comes to lemur politics. So if you see any of your lemurs doing any stink fighting, then you know it's starting to get serious. Now they also have some pretty prominent scent glands on their chest, right here and here. And also scent glands that you can't see around their backside as well. So the scents in the primate world are very, very important. Now you can see we're actually feeding our boys here some pretty tasty treats. It's a little bit naughty because uh, it is some banana and grapes and we consider that to be high value food item because of the sugar content. Ring-tailed lemurs in the wild really depend on a plant called the tamarind tree. Now when that tree is actually in fruit that will actually make up 50% of their diet. Now they are pretty opportunistic uh, because those trees are not always well relied upon throughout the entire seasons uh, but they will eat other different forms of uh, plants and flowers if you like. So any of the kind of fruit that they will be eating in the wild um, is, is not anywhere near as sugary as this stuff. So this is why it tastes really good. Um, we don't feed them a lot of this and we usually use it purely for training and conditioning and even enrichment as well. So they really, really do love it. So they're pretty intelligent as you can imagine. Now we can't really just sit in here and have our lemurs come up to us and be affectionate without a little bit of a positive reinforcer. And that's exactly what this is. Without this fruit, they would probably just wanna ignore us and think that they are you know, much better off without us, to be honest. They're not the type of uh, animal that you could have as a pet and be extremely affectionate. Hey, <laughs> you're gonna eat it all aren't you? <laughs> Thanks for tuning in with me, Keeper Jules and our beautiful lemurs and stay tuned for more educational videos on our Facebook page.